Ernest Hemingway. You've probably heard of him. Great, great guy. He fought yep. bull, bulls. Uh, Nobel Prize. Famous, famous neurologist. What? No. No. Okay. no. He's one of the most influential writers of the 20th century. And he was, as you sort of already hinted, Will, he was a larger-than-life kind of fellow. Yep. He had a macho swagger, a passion for adventure, which involved usually torturing and killing animals. And a, I'm going to modernize the term, huge capacity for partying. Uh, like, oh, yeah. No? No. 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 Drank, Drank a lot. He, he certainly did drink a lot. There's some excellent photos of him, and he's basically got a bottle of vodka jammed to his lips, and it does not move. I'm, I'm going to say in his defense, he probably had a few unreconciled problems, but anyway. <laughs> what a coincidence you should say that, because behind the bravado, he battled with serious mental health issues most of his life, yeah, okay. in fact. He, um, he spent a lot of time as a kid at a house in the woods near Michigan where his father, as it was put, passed down his love of hunting and the outdoors. <sighs> I, I didn't like where you, you were going there. Spent a lot of time in a cabin in the woods where his father, it just, it just <laughs> the story sounded bad. Maybe that's the start of the problem. No, no this is fine. This is fine. Okay. Um, he, but he struggled to connect with his father because apparently despite his placid exterior, his father could be violent and a domineering bully. So that's great. Okay. Um, he also had a fraught relationship with his mother, who apparently, the, the only quote I could find said, who dressed Hemingway as a girl when he was a child. Okay. Now, apparently that was a problem. Uh, look, I think in fairness to anyone gets to choose what they want to wear, but I think have your having your mother or father forcing you to be yeah. not what you are is not great. Not great. And child, child's not clear. I'm guessing not. We're not talking 18 months. I think we're talking, you know, old enough to go, I don't want to wear the dress anymore, mm -hmm. at least if you're Hemingway, the brave soldier. His third wife later wrote that his difficulties with women, like infidelity, cruelty, and abandonment, were probably because of his relationship with his mother. Mm -hmm. And his third wife was a journalist, so she'd know. Um, as a teen, he volunteered to be an ambulance driver in World War I, went over to Italy, and he was severely wounded, and there he fell in love with his nurse. So that's nice. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that is the classic <laughs> World War I story, though. Isn't it? Like, <laughs> I've read a lot of World War I novels and seen every movie made from World War I, and they all fall in love with their nurse. <laughs> anyway, her eventual rejection of him led to a depressive episode. Not good. Okay. That would become characteristic of his life. Depressive episodes was something that plagued him forever. After the war, he uh, joined a centre of artistic folk, expats known as the Lost Generation, people like F. Scott Fitzgerald. Hang on, did they, did they name themselves that? I think they were named externally. Okay, afterwards, fair enough. I, 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 but just going in with the name, we're the Lost Generation. It's, Don't worry about it's, us, we're the Lost Generation it's, and it's, we're artists. It's not a very positive name. It's not say, saying like we're the winners or we're the champion artists, best yeah, artists ever. we came out of the ever. war victorious, but yeah. we're lost now. I think no, I'm going to name my artist group champion artists and, and I'll get all good artists joining. These are broody people though. They okay. need the brood. Without the brood, how do they get the, 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 the muse? Yeah, fair enough. So they were mused by their lost generation. Apparently, though, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, and others got a little bit uh, tricky with Hemingway because he had a, quote, mercurial temperament, which was exacerbated by his trademark, huge drinking, and my best uh, quote here, pugilistic personality. Okay, so he's he's fighting people, and, and this sounds like he's boxing people. Like, he's literally got the jukes up, yeah. drinks a lot, but also yeah. he's like, give me my money back? What is no money, but he's just like gets pissed and punches on when he's not writing great novels. Mm. So also he was he would end up getting uh, very uh, jealous, mistrustful, and very very competitive. So that went well. That, that's what you want in a friend. <laughs> um, when he was twenty nine, his father took his own life, and that hit him very hard. So his mental health got less uh, robust. He still went on to win a Pulitzer Prize in nineteen fifty three and a Nobel Prize in Literature in nineteen fifty four. Do you know the novel, Will? That he got it for. For whom the bell yeah. tolls. Kind of. Isn't it? I think it was the old man and a fish. Oh, no. You, no, you get the Nobel Prize for literature for, for a bunch, for your no, whole. No, for all the books. For so the books was probably for one. <laughs> for your oeuvre. The, your oeuvre. Yeah. Um, so that was in 1954 he got the Nobel in literature. But in 1954 he was nearly killed in not one but two plane accidents in Africa as well because he's an adventurer. Um, he had a cracked skull, ruptured liver, ruptured spleen, cracked discs, and a, and a, and a host of other injuries which um, didn't go well for him. So these accidents, he ended up getting a sharp decline in his physical and mental health. So he was bedridden for a long time and he disregarded the doctor's orders to curb his drinking, as you would, because you're Hemingway. Um, then he and his fourth wife finally went back to Cuba where they'd been living since 1940. So this is about 1957. And he started working on what ended up being his final book, A Movable Feast. It was a memoir of his early years in Paris. Okay. 
We all know the one. Um, he didn't finish it. Uh, it was finished and published after he died. So he was struggling and becoming more and more frustrated. He's becoming more and more depressed. So his wife then left, uh, he and his wife left Cuba in July of 1960 because, you know, Castro and stuff. Apparently that became <laughs> less great. Okay. And over the next few months, he became a lot more isolated and paranoid. He already was, but he got worse and he was convinced he was under surveillance by the FBI. For all of his so, no. novel sedition? Yeah, probably. You wrote that book about the old man at the sea. What was he doing at the sea? We want names, we want witnesses, and we're going to take depositions. <laughs> so they settled in Idaho, and Hemingway's instability got worse and worse and worse. Um, he got to the point where even though he was getting publishing success, he was doing well, everyone liked him, et cetera, or liked his work, he thought and was convinced he was on the verge of going broke. So his wife and his physician convinced him to travel to the now very famous Mayo Clinic. I think it's in Minnesota. Um and he was given a bunch of treatments. One was the what was a new drug then called Librium. He was also given a much more radical intervention, which he said messed with his short-term memory and didn't offer a lot of relief. So just before he died, sadly, like his father, by his own hand, he mused about this radical treatment. And he said, what is the sense of ruining my head and erasing my memory, which is my capital, and putting me out of business? It was a brilliant cure, but we lost the patient. Welcome. Thank you. To The Wholesome Show. Science stories for people who sit up the back of the classroom. Like all of you out there in listening land and semi-watching land. It's exciting. Very. You're not excited? Very excited. Very excited. Uh, the Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant. And me, uh, Dr. Roderick Griffin. I have a Nobel laureate in podcasting, Lambert. Is that a con- category now? It's real. I've got the 1921... I mean, the 2021 Nobel Laureate for Podcasting. I didn't tell you, man. I didn't want you to feel bad. That's good. Congratulations. And we are joined today by... Yes, we are. Dr. Sham Al-Abed, who is a neuroscientist at the Eccles Institute of Neuroscience at the Australian National University. Now, I'm going to I'm going to tell you where Sham's from. She's from Bordeaux. So you would have heard this French accent coming in a little bit. She's from Bordeaux, not the wine, the region. And she came from France, what, three years ago? She has a background sussing out how memory works. And what happens in aging or with stress, et cetera, like when you get the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I looked it up. Uh-huh. Um, currently, though, she studies how the brain develops into circuits capable of, of memory yeah? and the disruptions when you get neurodevelopmental disorders like autism. Um, I'm going to let you talk about brain teaser yourself, Sham. Welcome. Hello. And how are you? Hi. Thank you guys for having me. Very excited about this. <laughs> oh, we we can still crush that. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, yes, and so, so as you said, I'm a neuroscientist, and um, because of the lockdown now, we are all online, but technically this event was supposed to be part of uh, Science Week, uh, nice. two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and we're supposed to be live, and um, the students at uh, the PhD students in, in my institute uh, organized this entire public event talking about neuroscience, was like, supposed to be amazing and in person and then COVID. So um, at least we get to do this uh, online. And um, we have done, uh, instead of the face-to-face thing, we've done, um, well, we've, they have done <laughs> a gorgeous always, website. Always taking credit for the work of students. Typical Exactly. Researcher. Typical researcher. Typical yeah. researcher. We enslave the students. You know, we just stay, you know, have coffees. And then we're like, yes, I, I'm great. And I did all of that. That's, that's the way it works. <laughs> I think that's going well. So that, they, are, they are the brain teasers, is that right? The people who are, it's their fault yes. we're here. Exactly. So, uh, so they've created this entire website, uh, brainteaser2021.com. I think I'll check the, email, the website uh, in the chat. So you should go check it out. We did like a lot of like, uh, you know, virtual booth on like everything that we study uh, at the Eccles. And so, uh, and we did also a day of presentation last last Saturday. So there's plenty of like amazing talks from uh, senior researchers and students. So you should check it out. We'll put all the videos on the on the website shortly. Well, thank you. It's very brave of you to come and do this because that will be nothing like the amazing talks by experts and intellectuals. This is, <laughs> this is going to be like the, uh, the the dessert or maybe the antidote to all that. I think it's fair it's- to say. 
it's the perfect, you know, 7 p.m. chat, you know, around when... 7, 7, 10, you know, close enough. Yeah, something like that. But it's, it's, it's great because it's an area that's um, not to, not to uh, belittle your PhD, but it's really simple and easy. So idiots like mm. Rod and I, we can just reckon that there's a bunch of gooey stuff in your brain and that's how it yep. all works. So, yeah. so don't worry. I've got it sorted. Don't I've worry. Got it sorted we've, for got, this we've got neuroscience all down pat, ready to go. Oh, I just came to like, you know, listen to you guys and have a drink. That's it. Like, Yeah, it's true. You might learn something from this. I, I tell you, there's some absolutely earth shattering stuff. Or potentially stuff. unlearn something. So, Sham, if this ruins <laughs> if this ruins your PhD and we delete knowledge from your brain, uh, yeah, it's okay. you, I don't you know. You can be unvaccinated and un-PhD'd here. <laughs> All righty, let's roll on. So, when you dig into the history of psychiatric medicine, it's hard not to conclude the underlying mantra is basically, or has been, you've got to be cruel to be kind. Oh, no, always. That's what I was thinking. You were going to tell me cruelty, 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 and then yeah. it's 2021 and we've tried not to be. But that's Uncruelled. Basically. It's been so cruel with COVID that we've uncruelled it. So Although, a few- I, did, I, did, I did hear a story just today yeah. of someone who, uh, she went to visit her dad in a psychiatric institute when she was growing up and her, her, Sweet. her upbringing wasn't great. She went into the psychiatric institute to visit her dad and she was like, oh damn, this is neat and clean and, and tidy. So there might be times when it's you know, not, not always the worst. Yeah, it's clean. You can imagine coming away. What was it like, sweetheart? It was, it was clean. It was, it was clean. <laughs> it was no dirt. How was your father? Lots we're, we're, of bleach. Clean. Yeah. Dad was clean. Yeah, that's literally the equivalent of how was your date last night? He was yeah. clean. Kind. Kind. <laughs> he clearly ironed his shirt. Eyes. I don't think I've ever described a date like that. How was your date? Pretty clean. <laughs> I don't know though. I wouldn't want to, you know, be described as unironed at a date. I mean, you've got to take it well, seriously. Yeah, you don't want on to leave my end of the, On my end of the of the dating pool, uh, that's something that you could actually say. You know what? He was clean. <laughs> it's better than how was your date? Dirty. <laughs> so anyway, here's a few examples from the early, early stages of uh, psychiatric, let's call it help. In the late 1800s, fevers used to be induced in people to try and treat certain aspects of mental illness. So a great example, and great is, I'm going to use a lot of bunny quotes with my voice. Uh, Austrian psychiatrist Julius Wagner Jaureg, that's a flawless accent, by the way. He infected a person who was suffering from syphilis psychosis with malaria oh, in order to give see, them See, I was going to ask. I was going to ask, how do you give people hmm. the fever? And you go straight down to malaria. Straight to malaria. I, wa- I want the nightmare <laughs> fever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can imagine it, can't you? you? You don't seem to be very well. You seem to be psychotic and bits of your face are falling off from syphilis. What is the Would you theory like malaria? underpinning that that says, okay, you're going to get better with a little bit of uh, malaria? Well, there, there was evidence that the fever would help treat some of these psychoses and some of these problems. Of course, then you got malaria and you used to be psychotic and may become psychotic again. That's why we don't do that as much anymore. <laughs> as much? Um, yeah, not as much. Another one, in the 1930s, we've got a cracker here. Uh, people would deliberately uh, put people into one to four hour comas by deliberately lowering their blood sugar. Again, they wow. basically called them insulin comas. So they they figured that if you dramatically change levels of insulin, it would alter the wiring in people's brains. And this was so popular, it only really fell out of favour in the 1960s. Hang on, but how do you give me give me a method here? Not that I'm wanting to do this myself or anything like that. How are you lowering people's blood sugar? Like I assume you stuff them full of insulin. Oh, okay. Which is great. Insulin comas are a thing. Um, they're not recommended. Yeah. They don't say you're diabetic now. Why don't you try an insulin coma? Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, it's not great. Um, also, one of the parents of modern lobotomy, Walter Freeman, would directly, basically, brain damage people. And we did a nice episode on that called "The Terrible History of Lobotomy" back in December 2018. So he actually wrote a paper in 1941 called "Brain Damaging Therapeutics," and he didn't mean that as a problem. It wasn't yeah. look out, these therapies cause damage. It was damage the brain in order to therapeutify. Yeah, well, see, that's that's back in the day that uh, scientists were a lot clearer with their language. You know, they, they used yes. the words that people had on the street. They didn't they yeah. didn't hide the word brain damaged in uh, modern, yeah. modern ob- obfuscation. I mean, you'd say it now, there'd be a whole bunch cool. of uh, bifurcation and uh, other technical Weasel words. words. Yeah. There'd be corporate speak around it. I mean, do you do a lot of brain damaging of people um, in, in your work, Sean? Or is that not, it's not cool no, anymore? No, just in my personal life. I just use my skill for my personal life. As long life. as you've got a hobby. I mean, it's great when you yeah, can bring yeah, yeah. your interests and your work together. I think that's really good. Exactly. It's like, you know, if, 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 you, if, you, do, if you do your passion every day, like, yes. you know, you feel like you, don't, you never work. So 
I, I mean, I think this is great. I didn't know this about you. This is this is going to be interesting because we've only just started. <laughs> so that's that's some history. Um, the, the lobotomy episode I can highly recommend because my God, Walter Freeman was um, let's call it a motivated man. But anyway, with that pedigree of interesting ways of treating mental disorder, we turn to my buddy, your buddy, everyone's buddy, Ladisla Meduna. Mm. Now, Ladisla or Ladisla. Slow, or slow down on that name. I heard a lot of syllables. <laughs> Here we go. Um, I'll spell it. L A D I S L A S. Ladisla. 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 Okay. Meduna is is he's Hungarian. Okay. He was he was born in the Budapest. Born in the Budapest, Budapest. in 1896. Um, his family were a bit posh. So he sometimes went by Fon Meduna, but no one actually quite knows why, but he just sort of lobbed in a Fon. I would. I'm thinking of changing my name to Fon Lamberts, because why the fuck not? It just sounds cooler. You can think of it too, Fon Grant. No, he started studying. No, you don't want to do it? No. I don't believe in lording it over with people titles. Anyway, you know, certainly you? not I, Hungarian I, titles. I don't have a, I don't have any rights to Hungarian titles. Fon is not a Hungarian title. It's like a, a thing you stuff on the front of a name it's in many it's countries. It's he started studying medicine in 1914, but then he took a three-year kind of gap year because he had to go and fight at the Italian front. So in 1921, he finally graduated post-World War I. Um, he worked in the Hungarian Inter-Academic Institute for Brain Research. I mean, is that still famous, Sharm? Is that something that still exists? I, I don't think so. No? The maybe. Hungarian Inter-Academic Institute for Brain Research? No? Um, um, I okay, that's really bad because yeah. I'm from Europe. I am from Europe. On top of that, I don't even Europe have is a whole big country, like, though, Sharm. I mean, like, oh, you know, it's like North Hemisphere mm-hmm. over there. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's very close from my hometown. <laughs> Still, considering I mean, you can't know all about Hungary, that's not fair. You're not a Hungarianist. Thank you, thank you for being very gracious with my lack of that's knowledge. Roll. I'm, about, I'm, uh, I'm always Hungarian. kind to neuroscientists because you never know when they're going to have to get in there and mess with your brain. So I'm being careful. So anyway, he studied there <laughs> and he studied neuropathology, so broken brain things yep. and the structure and development of the pineal gland, microglia, uh-huh. and lead poisoning, things like that. Uh, which which was, of those do I need to remember? For later. Uh, remember microglia. Microglia. Okay, cool. cool. Uh, what then, is glia? Then can you tell me glia. what a glia is? We're going to get to that, or okay. rather, someone else is going to get to that. Maybe our special guest. <laughs> She's going to use the one, the one, the one sentence version. But so, he, so he moved in 1927 to the a psychiatric institute, out a bit from um, Budapest, and he began clinical research work in psychopathology. And he really got right into schizophrenia and brain glia. So glia, ah, not to put you on the spot, Sham, is this an easy <laughs> question to answer? What are glia? So uh, in, the, in the brain, you have like many different types of, of cells and um, you have two main uh, types and it's either the, the neurons or the glia. So it's like oh. it was at first it was supposed to, not, not supposed, was thought to be just supporting cells, just there to kind of like feed the neurons and support it and do some kind of scaffold or something like that. But uh, now it's known that it actually has a lot more roles in that and it actually actively participates in the trans- transmission of information. And yeah, as and well particular- as neurons. So Sorry? neurons do it and glia do it. Uh, it's not really that they do it, it's that they regulate it. So oh, okay. they really like when you have like a synapse that it's like two parts like that, yep. um, it's going to like one one kind of glia uh, called astrocytes. They kind of like go around the synapse and they, they're super important for like the regulation of, of the transmission of like all the different molecules that are there. Yep. Um, they really make sure that basically nothing nothing goes bad. So what, what just give me for um, – I'm I'm happily at the level of really quite dumb about brain science. Uh, <laughs> you know, people had said to me brain cells, and I would think neurons. I'd think like, uh, yes. you know, mm. it's it's got a long end. I think that's uh, an axon. Yeah. Like it looks like a an octopus that's got one super long tentacle, and then and then others that are you know all over the place. Very Something creepy like octopus. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 What what, yes. what what does a glare look like? Is it different shaped or is it you can tell me it's the same shape aren't yeah you? so it have it have many different shapes um the the one char- like i think that's the axon that you were talking about it's like the main characteristic of a neuron like mm-hmm. the main difference that you would have uh, in terms of of shape even though neurons can have a lot of different morphologies as well but um um i don't think any of the glial cells that i know would have like one long um, Cre- creepy prolongation thing. like that yeah exactly yeah. so uh the main type of of glial cells it's called astrocytes because it looks like 
uh, a star. It's like okay. it has a lot. So if I see one on the street or something like that, I'll check for an axon. You'll be like, and- you'll be like astrocyte. Astrocyte. Like, you know, it's it's well that look, that's um that's more information than um, Maduna gave me. Gave yeah, he, and microglia, yeah, and microglia. It's basically the um, the immune system of the brain. It's like the oh in okay. situ immune system of the brain. I have so learned I, something. I that know. is awesome. Thank you. No, Rod, I've learned something from what you've said tonight, but I've learned lots from Sean right now. <laughs> oh, you are, you're going to learn things you hope, you're going to hope to unlearn pretty soon. Don't worry. I'm, I'm here to help, man. You know that. I'm always here to help you. <laughs> so they weren't very specific in this source about which of the glee, glia, glias. Yeah, glial cells. I like glee. That sounds nice. Glee. The glial cells that he was into, but what he did notice, because he was into psychopathology and he was very into schizophrenia, he noticed that patients who that had autopsies on patients who died with epilepsy, not necessarily from it, but with it, oh. they had more glia than normal. And those who had schizophrenia who died with schizophrenia had less glia than normal. Oh. So there's something going on. There was at least some kind of connection. Just yeah, another point. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you a lot of dumb questions here. Yep. <laughs> glia and neurons scattered uh, all through the brain. They're, they're, they're all over the place. Yep. All the glia. They're yep. really like intricated like that. Like okay. Yep. Mm. They weave and wibble through. So it also seems then at the time, the incidence of epilepsy in hospitalized patients who had schizophrenia was really low. So piss all schizophrenics in hospital had epilepsy. Yep. And and the few schizophrenic patients they were aware of who got seizures, like if they'd had an infection or a head trauma, the schizophrenic patients had seizures and it relieved their psychoses. So it relieved, if not got rid of the symptoms oh, of schizophrenia. Okay, all right. Now I'm starting to see a little bit of that association between the, you know, give them a painful treatment and maybe it feels better. Yeah, let's just smack them in the head or infect them and boom, no more schizophrenia. That's not quite where we're at. Give it, give it time. So the theory was that at the time, epilepsy could not exist alongside the many different things they called schizophrenia. Schizophrenia has taken quite a beating over the years. It's had many subcategories and stuff. So yeah, you couldn't have epilepsy if you had schizophrenia and vice versa. It seemed. So that led doctors to go, all righty, how do we treat epileptics? We inject them with the blood from schizophrenic people. No, of course they did. Of <laughs> As course would. they did. <laughs> <laughs> how do we get some schizophrenia out of this person and put it into the other person? What a, what a time to be alive, though. Wait a minute. They don't have it? Shoot the blood into them then. Let's see. Let's shoot. What, what could possibly go I love, on? though. I love, though. It's, all, it's always the blood. Like, you never you're, go. You're, not, yeah, you're not picturing, like, a, a good thing about scientists right now like you know we desperately need scientists to have a, a nice aura at the moment <laughs> and when we come up with like you know implacable you know sure. like that, all, all modern scientists are perfect it's just the, the scientists <laughs> right? um 30 years ago 50 years mm. ago 100 that, they were all crazy it's just, crazy it's just it, well, there's a cutoff it's weird it's weird <laughs> if you think i'm painting them badly now you you might want to mute for a bit <laughs> <laughs> Just for a bit. It's okay, maybe, I can take it. Can take why it. is it always blood? I mean, why couldn't it be some other yeah. bit? You know, no. A bit of your <laughs> brain you cell, like, some fingernails. Schizophrenic oh. urine? Oh, I'll drink, be- drink this. I, I'll bet people did <laughs> think that one next, actually. Drink the wee, you'll be better. No, there's no wee in this episode. It's unusual for me. So psychiatrists went the other way. They said, okay, we want to induce epilepsy or at least seizures, epileptic seizures in schizophrenics why to try and get- help them. Uh, a Not schizophrenic person and an epileptic person just rubbing against each other. A Getting to bit. kiss really just deeply. Yeah, just hug a little. <laughs> hug a little. I don't think hugging is enough. You don't, you don't get the transfer of the fluids. So I think you need a little bit of the patch. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, Maduna figured if you got seizures in people with schizophrenia, it would increase the concentration of glia in their brain and relieve the illness. Don't worry. You don't need to remember the glia or the technical stuff. Um, it wasn't made clear why seizures might increase the amount of glia. I didn't find that. Um, though current work in epilepsy seems to still talk about some kind of role for glia or okay. sub-variations of it. Anyway, we don't want to get too carried away with that because without a whiteboard, it could get very confusing. Um, so anyway, M- Maduna went, cool, 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 cool. Let's try and induce seizures in animals because that's what you do. Yeah, this could course. help people. Yeah. Let's fuck with animals. Mm. Is this making them sound bad still, Sharma, or is that all right? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> In reserve judgment. Okay, so he'd, he'd take animals. I didn't get the specifics of the animals. And he'd do things like give them strychnine, oh. um, thebane, 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 um, a.k.a. codeine, methyl, enol, ether. We all know that yeah, one. Of course. <laughs> My favourite was brucin because it was named after James <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> what do we call it? What's his name? Bruce. Okay, Bruce. 
Um, he was a Scottish explorer in the 1700s. Not that that necessarily matters. And so that's an anti-inflammatory and an analgesic. So it was a pain relief and stuff. And they even tried caffeine to get animals to seize. That's how much caffeine? Of, how much yeah. caffeine? Oh, oh, that's a lot of caffeine? I, I don't Maybe even want to think enough. about that. I like yeah. coffee. <laughs> I don't even like feeling queasy from too much caffeine. So to actually make me seize up, that'd be a shitload of short blacks. <laughs> but ultimately they chose, they went with camphor oil or camphor dissolved in oil. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, camphor. What even yeah. is that other than for protecting your Nana's blankets? Like that's the it's, only thing. Yeah, it is. It's old lady can, house smell. It, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Camphor's strong. If someone said, we're just going to put some this and some oil and inject it into you, I'd say, I'll, I'll, I'll take No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. I'm not... <laughs> I don't want it. I don't want it near me, but I just don't know what it is. Like, it's it's a chemical compound made out of materials that can induce seizures in animals when suspended in oil. Okay. You're welcome. Thank You're you. You're welcome. <laughs> so the problem now was he needed a steady supply of people with severe schizophrenia. You know, as we do, that happens. Um, I'm sure you run out of those as well at work, Sharm. I can understand that. That's l- Literally, my main problem. I get it. Well, maybe at the end of this, we'll we'll get you we'll get you some. It's just that the way that you, the way you describe it as a steady supply. It just it just sounds a little bit too. I need some sort of factory process here. That's yeah. that's exactly what I had in mind. That would be perfect. <laughs> yeah, not a factory. Scientific continuation. You need to do replication. We know that this is just sound science. Spontaneous generation. It's not. Yeah. You need a lot of samples, otherwise it's it's shaky science. So he <laughs> went to a. Um, psychiatric hospital and began experimenting in uh, 1934. So nine of the first 11 patients that he tried this stuff on were catatonic. Now catatonia, as we all, it's where you basically freeze up, can't move, don't react to external stimuli, but you're definitely alive. There are variations of it. Uh, Different to a coma? Different to a coma. Actually uh, eyes awake, sitting up and stuff. You can, you can move people around. You're not unconscious. But you are frozen. Have I yeah. misrepresented that, Sharma? Was that all right? No, that's yeah, that's exactly that. I'm not used to being right about that. The last <laughs> time I looked at catatonia was for my abnormal psych exam in 1992. That's when it was still considered still relevant. Mis- still basically the same. Nothing much has changed since 1992. Apparently, they don't call it. I don't moved. think it's, it's not part of schizophrenia. It doesn't matter anyway. It just so happened that uh, catatonia is remarkably responsive to induced seizures. So you give someone a seizure. Not surprisingly, they weren't moving. You give them a seizure, they move. Okay, yeah, but what happens after? After the end of the seizure, do they go back to catatonia or? <laughs> Three of them had, quote, a positive response. Okay. And in one case, uh, there was a 33-year-old who was a severe catatonic patient. Apparently, after five treatments, uh, his catatonia and psychotic symptoms were, quote, abolished. Ah, all right. Eradicated. Boom, all gone, job done, off you go, champ. So that's cool. That's oh, not a bad result, actually. I, and look, I, I just, I think someone who is uh, permanently in a state like that, uh, I can imagine wanting to try quite a few things. Even if I was um, them on the inside, I'd be, I'd be wanting to try a few things. I may, may, look, maybe it's pleasant, but I doubt it. I don't think it'd be that relaxing, being totally stiff, stunned and unable to interact. But I haven't given it a go. <laughs> to be fair, I haven't tried. Um, he then ramped up his experiments. He got 26 patients and 10 of them recovered and three became a bit better. So that's basically half at least improved. So that's cool. I think that's good. That's has a good yeah. result. But so after his first injections though, Maduna said was apparently he was so distressed. He had to be supported to his room by the nurses because the reactions it uh, brought forth in people were apparently fairly um, yeah, I'm sure. eye widening. Uh. Cause remember we're inducing seizures here uh, deliberately. So anyway, they thought, how do we make this a bit better? So if you shoot camphor into your muscles, it can take from 15 to 45 minutes to get a really good seizure going. So that's a lot of waiting around. You get bored. It's not efficient. I don't, so like, th- I don't like the vision of it coming on slowly over that period. I mean, I don't like it coming on quickly, oh. but. If I'm going to have a seizure, I just want to get the fuck on with it. Like, I don't want to sit around waiting. Is it time yet? Is it time yet? No, oh. I'd- so quite early on, they replaced camphor with, uh, God, hang on, pentol and metetrazole. Met, metrazole, the drug is usually called metrazole. They replaced it. This apparently got people seizing within a few minutes, so that's pretty cool. Stick it in, count to 10, boom, they're okay. spasming on the floor and <laughs> probably peeing themselves. Fantastic cure. Um, also, it's a, um, it's a potent cardiac and respiratory stimulant. So patients experience sensations that most considered, quote, unpleasant okay like no unpleasant uh (laughs) 
spasming. Uh, they, were, they were basically completely alert until the seizures actually rendered them unconscious. So they were aware of it coming on. They were aware of it happening until they seized enough to pass out. Um, and they remembered everything. So it's not like they spasmed. It was horrible. But then they woke up and went, what happened? They were fully God. aware. Oh, this is horrible. That's pretty cool. Mm. And so Maduna and some of his colleagues, they suspected that the uh, people's abject terror at actually having this done to them may have been part of the reason some of them were successfully. Oh, God. Cured. Oh, God. We're going to frighten you out of this state. No. <laughs> no, I don't like that at all. Stop having schizophrenia or we'll do this to you. Um, that's, yeah, you know, that's uh, 1940s, sorry, 30s psychology. Uh, so that's pretty cool. He did, a, he did a major publication. He did a text in 1937. It was called... Here's my flawless German. The Convulsion Therapy der Schizophrenie. That's my French, German, Russian accent. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. See, that's from an expert. That's from someone who yes. knows. From a European. Thank you. Who doesn't know much about Hungary, though. It's not that Europe. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's, it's so over there. So he described the results of 110 patients, of, of which about half recovered. So that's pretty cool. I think that's uh, a decent rate. I think that's it's a, not bad. What, what else? I mean, were people getting any success any other way at the time? I'm, I'm guessing no. There you go. Shit all. So yeah, that's, it was that's really going result. well. Um, and it worked much better for patients who'd been ill for less than a year, though. So it worked more on better. You've got to get them fresh. You've got to get them yep. fresh. So when he's asking for his uh, catatonic schizophrenic patients, I need fresh ones. So yep. ready supply, fresh yep. ones. He, he doesn't want them institution material. No. He wants them straight <laughs> off the boat and in, in, into the seizures. Fresh meat. I, I, I think if you put in your participant recruitment in any study, if you say, I want them fresh, I, th yeah. I think that the, the ethics board might frown at that for a little Are bit. Are you a freshly diagnosed catatonic? Do you know what to, not, what to do with your time? Why not come and see Joseph or whatever his name was, Medina? Sorry, what was his name? Slatis Lothloth. Take part in a research study. Must be fresh. <laughs> yeah, it's not great. Sham, please, next time, next time. All, all your participant recruitment must be fresh. Um, yes, like, but then it's on you if I can't find anyone. That's uh, the okay, only, okay. But okay. I'm so keen okay. on doing uh, Look, it, it, oh, no, it does sound you. a little bit creepy and maybe people might veto it. But anyway, just, just imagine. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. We're, really, we're really big in such circles. We can get you some fresh people. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> We have nearly five and a half gajillion listeners, and most of them <laughs> very fresh. Dubi dubious all, no, all of our listeners are very fresh. They are very fresh. <laughs> so his results were quickly reproduced and, and taken up, and they were repeated around the world, and it became basically one of the most, if not the most widely popular first effective treatments for schizophrenia, which is pretty cool. Um, he also developed another one. Uh, this is I just have to say this before we move away from lettuce loss. He developed a carbon dioxide therapy. This is great. You're really going to want to do this. I was hoping we could test it on you if we'd done the show live, Will, but we sadly, it was. I off. don't want that because. No, you'd love it. Okay. The patients breathe a gaseous mixture of 30% carbon dioxide and 70% oxygen, the usually shortcut to carboxygen yeah. or carbogen, yep. or sometimes called Meduna's mixture, which immediately <laughs> makes it sound sinister. <laughs> what do you need? More, more, more is Meduna's mixture. Meduna mixture. Yeah. It could be a good cocktail too, but I'd get someone else to drink one first <laughs> because it's designed to provoke a powerful feeling of suffocation after only a few breaths, not a, a, a powerful feeling of suffocation. Then the patient enters an unresponsive but intense altered state. Oh, great. <laughs> so you feel like you're going to die. It's very unpleasant. And then you are no longer quite in touch with reality. Oh my God. No, no, thank you. No, I'll, I'll miss that one. You sure. Um, the treatment, quote, while usually unpleasant or even terrifying, I'm going to go with straight to terrifying, um, proved apparently to be very useful for revealing a previously unconscious fears. Look, I just, I just to go back to the, uh, the the methods available to psychiatrists in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah. Uh, you know, when on their list is Maduna's mixture or lobotomy mm. or all sorts of other uh, intensely what we would call barbaric sorts of uh, interventions. Sure. Maybe maybe Maduna's mixture sounds like the the chipper one. Maybe that's the. That's no, look, you're going to feel a little bit like you're dying, but only briefly. <laughs> And so before you didn't know you were afraid of things, but after doing that, then you know, like, it, like it reveals yeah. like, yeah. so potentially you're worse after? Yeah, I, I, I imagine so. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know I was crapping myself about that. But now every day, a brand new horror. Uh, that wasn't in the stuff I read, but that's a fair question. Yeah. Um, yeah, apparently, what do they call it? Challenging experiences on carbogen prepared patients for later psychedelic therapy 
So psychedelics, <laughs> such that, and I know Sham, you've you have in your biography PTSD, and yes. that's becoming. Uh, actually, we're gonna we're gonna get you back on and talk about all this stuff. Um, psychedelics for PTSD is becoming something a lot more popular lately, or at least being mm-hmm. tested. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's like I, it's still like super debated whether it's mm. actually doing something or not. But mm. apparently, because PTSD, it's I I don't think that people usually. Uh, realize that but it's actually an alteration of of the the memory that you have of a highly stressful event that's so that's almost purely a a memory alteration um Ah. and so and so the psychedelics apparently uh just kind of like um put the brain in the state that allows you to um reshape your memories and so that's how it works so basically from what I from what I understand, uh, they just give like you know kind of low amounts of psychedelics to patients yep. enough so that basically their brain is very plastic and you can then do some kind of like a like classical kind of, of therapy and and you can actually reshape the memory and bring it into consciousness and trying to like make it a bit more safe and that's wow. how you kind of reduce it reduce like the the fear associated with with. With that event you are definitely coming back for episode two because i want to know a shit ton <laughs> more about that that's fascinating it's pretty cool it's actually really really cool but it's still like there's going to be a lot of like societal issue about that because a lot yeah. of people are just going to be like no it's a drug it's bad even though probably yeah. if they had done it we need politicians to do more of like that kind of drug so that you know they're a bit chiller um I, i'd rather give a lot of them this suffocation treatment and if it doesn't work <laughs> i'm quite happy with that <laughs> I don't know that the the yeah. PTSD and psychedelics sounds pretty plausible to me. Like I, I it sure. sounds like it's all working in that area of the brain. So you know, go to. Yeah. I don't yeah. know it's about memory. Apparently, though, this this psychedelic or that sorry, this precursor was not particularly good um, in helping uh, schizophrenics, and nowhere near as effective as seizure induction, induction, inductifying, bringing on seizures. So, um, inducing seizures is becoming all the rage for these kinds of strong psychiatric conditions but of course chemicals are super messy they're a bit little bit dirty and crass you've got to mix them they're, they're difficult they're un, they're impure they're not clean <laughs> okay, like psychiatric okay. wards. but you're leading me somewhere i don't want to go so there, there had to be a better way now as you'd be aware i'm sure biological and medical folk have been absolutely enthralled by electricity for uh, years. Uh, no 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 all right what? we're talking okay. about this is, this is therapy man this is good for people they love electricity. They have for ages. So you have uh, the classic is the galvanists named after Luigi Galvani. So they're right into um, the pioneers of bioelectricity. So Galvani himself, Luge, as I prefer to call him, because that's what you call Luigi. He proposed the existence of animal electricity. And he did stuff like, you know, cut frogs in half, pin them out on bits of wood with electricity and shot stuff through them and it made their legs wiggle and stuff. That's why they thought it was uh, it was life or something like that. It's a life force. The, fr- the Kinda, legs yeah, coming yeah. back to life. Electrical juice. He reckoned it was generated in the brain and <laughs> flowed through the nerves and supplied the muscles with power. So that was Galvani. Have I misrepresented Galvani, Sharma? Do you know? Um, I don't know specifically, but I felt like I believe it. You look it up? Yeah, you look it up later. I, I like, you know, it's like it's very, yeah. So that was the beginning of the Galvanist. But um, Galvani's nephew, Giovanni Aldini, followed in Uncle Luge's footsteps. But he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy just playing with amphibian hindquarters. That was not enough. So in 1803. It's a great, it's a great nephew uncle relationship, though. Isn't it? Like, like Isn't it's it? like, can I come over to your place and like play with your electrical stuff and your electrical frog's legs? I, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I want to cut I want to cut a creature in half <laughs> exactly. and, and then electrocute it. It does sound like at school, legs. though. You're like, I got an uncle. He's, he does these weird stuff with the frog's legs. Um, you know, we can <laughs> Listen, go. It's going to sound creepy at first, but stick with me because soon you'll learn something. And you know what? If it's your dad, you're like, all right, no, dad, can you stop <laughs> doing that? That's that's really embarrassing. But you're uncle. My friends, your uncle is far enough removed that you're happy to go over their house and go, Let's do something wacky with his electricity. The cool uncle, that's for sure. That's for sure. The cool or the weird uncle, that's just Uncle Luge. Don't worry about him. (laughs) So Aldini followed in Luge's footsteps, but he wanted to take up a notch. And by a notch, I mean all the notches. So in 1803, the body of a recently hanged murderer, George Forster. Oh, thank you. Thank you, 19th century people. Fuck yeah. This is early 19th century too, so he was a, he was a thought leader. Um, George Forster's body was taken straight from the gallows of the prison in London <laughs> and sent to the Royal College of Surgeons, where Aldini was waiting in front of an audience of people who, <laughs> oh, at least honest. some, 
Bring him up. Yeah, no, they thought, a lot of them thought, and this is including doctors and stuff, they thought, oh, he's going to bring Forster back to life. Did they really? Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah. That is so, but also, yeah. why not get like a nice old lady who happened to die in her bed and you go, let's bring her back to life? Not like Wait till some- I describe the procedure and then maybe you'll know why. Okay, yes, all right. But but why <laughs> why is the person you want to bring back who, okay, there's there's a 5% Murderer. chance you're going to bring them back. Let's get some crazy criminal psychopath. You know, this is a <laughs> horror movie. Why not get the nice old lady? Because or- you could just kill him again. You've done it once. You've I gotten guess- used to the idea. Just kill him again. <laughs> He's a murderer anyway. I mean, you know, there's no double jeopardy at this time and in this country. So they thought, not not all of them, but apparently a fair number of them thought he's, he's going to bring this guy back to life because it's the magic of electricity. So Aldini applied conducting rods connected to a large battery to Forster's face. And the quote, the jaw began to quiver. The adjoining muscles were horribly contorted and the left eye actually opened. Oh, <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Damn, this is a hot ticket, though. This is like if you were if the, tomorrow night, you're like, you, you should have seen what I saw the other Anyone night. I'm getting hanged tomorrow because I really want to see Bing. this. This is this is pre intermission because the climax of the performance came, and I'm quoting again as Aldini probed Forster's rectum. Don't leave rectum. the word climax. Like, don't. Well, he probed Forster's rectum. That, that's the bum hole. Yes, yes. It caused him to clench his fist and punch the air as if in fury, his legs to kick and his back to arch violently. What do you mean as if in fury? Yeah. For sure he was in fury. <laughs> Beyond the grave, anyone is doing that without my permission. Yeah, exactly. My arm goes up. punch you forever. <laughs> I'm thinking if you punch in the air, you're going, yes, finally, I've got electricity in my bum. Seriously, sure. consent applies even when people are dead. So, Yeah, no. He's a murderer. It doesn't matter. So anyway, no, that was what he did. No. So people went, oh, my goodness. Um, of course, then he stopped. He didn't get up and walk away and go on to murder further. So God Aldini damn, was that, a is such a, that is such a cool show. That's a relief. How, how, how did they not put this on like every night for months and months and months? <laughs> they, they may have. They probably still do. <laughs> so I can get his eye open and now watch this one. Bing! We stick it in his bum and he'll punch something. Watch, we'll put this board in front of him and see if he can smash it. Um. <laughs> So Aldini was a real fan of electricity's potential to treat paralysis, rheumatism as, as a, quote, purgative and to re- revive drowned people. But he admitted he was never able to restart hearts. So he couldn't bring people back to life. And he was, he was honest about that. <laughs> Others were less honest. So a guy called uh, Karl August Weinholt, a German scientist, claimed to have brought animals back from the dead. He did this in ways that I'm... I'm just going to give you one description. So he experimented with things like he would... Um, decapitate kittens, pull out their spinal cord, replace Stop. it with zinc and silver batteries, and that generated an electric charge. Not only did their hearts start beating again, but according to him anyway, the kittens would bound around for several minutes. Again, so how good's electricity? Again, that is such a cool plot for a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has been. <laughs> Why kittens? Why kittens? Why not kittens? Because otherwise they're going to cats and then they kill a local fauna. I am not a lover of cats, but... No, I don't want to murder cats either. I don't want to have one, but I don't want to murder them. That, that seems a bit rich. There are better things to murder than and cats. And where in your lit review did you think, okay, what, what it needs to be is batteries in the spine. Like, that's where we've got to do it. You don't Not in the spine, the, instead of. Instead of the spine. like Instead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Sham's out. She's gone. That's it. She's <laughs> out the back and run to the bathroom. So to be fair, these sorts of demonstrations were pivotal in understanding physiology and electricity. Of course. But of course, they're greatest claim to fame was inspiring Mary Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein. So basically these gave us the archetypal mad scientist. So sorry, Sham, once more, we're not making scientists look good. It's it's okay. We can improve this. I've accepted my fate. It's fine. It's fine. No, no, I'm going to make it better. Let's get back to treating the, treating the mentally ill with seizures. (laughs) So a similar time to when Maduna was giving people chemicals, uh, an Italian neurologist called Ugo Cerletti was giving electricity a bit of a crack. He thought, Let's see what we can do with electricity on uh, people. But first he started with dogs. He'd put electrodes in their mouth and their rectum. The, the bum course, was very popular. Yeah. front and back. It's, it's the positive and negative of the body. That's, That's exactly you know, that. If you're going to make a battery a out battery, of a dog, yeah. yep, the mouth and the bum. The spit battery, they call it. Um, many died, though. It stopped their hearts, and that was not his intention. He didn't want to kill them. He wanted to electrify them and not kill them. So he found a way to get around that by accident because he was looking at what happened to pigs in slaughterhouses. And apparently for some perverse reason, they would electrocute pigs first, but they put the the metallic tongs on their heads, on their temples. 
So that would make them fall to the ground, stiffen and pass out and convulse, but they didn't die. So the, the killing of the pigs happened in other ways later on. So good job. <laughs> yeah, a great job, isn't it? I electrocute them. I don't kill them. I just electrocute them and someone else does the rest. So Chaletti went, this is awesome. We, let's, let's try it on a, on a dude. A dude? A dude? Yeah, let's, try it on, let's try it on a chap. Really? I, I thought you were going to say dog or kitten. Nope. Uh, he went to a man. So electroconvulsive therapy was born in 1938. He, uh, his first human subject was a 39-year-old engineer from Milan who was found wandering in a confused state around a train station in Rome. He might have just been <laughs> waiting for his train. He's, he's drunk he and he's waiting for his train and and some yeah. mad scientist has literally grabbed him off the track. Sir, no, sir, fair, the, the police sir, did it. The police you look confused. confused. Let me electrify you. Yeah, you look confused. I'm a police. I'm going to take you to this guy and we're going to mess oh. with your head. So apparently the first round of electric shocks really didn't get a, a desired convulsion. So Chaletti and his assistant said, should we, they had a chat, should we administer a more powerful dose? And of course the answer was, hell yeah, we should. Jesus so Christ, hang on, just can, can you yeah. confirm for me this went through an ethics board? Uh, can I confirm it did? Consent, it did. there was anything yep. here? All of that, utterly ethics approved and utter yeah. consent was absolutely. You're on the board, order. right? Yep, it, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely, it was, it was flawless ethical procedures. Yeah, okay. My bet is they grabbed him, took him to this guy and said, the dude's nuts, we don't know what he's talking about, have you got any ideas? And Chaletti said, shit, yeah. Okay. So apparently after the strongest shock, Having consulted with his assistant, he's not a monster. The stronger shock, this is what Celletti said. All at once, the patient who evidently had been following our conversation said clearly and solemnly, without his usual gibberish, not another one. This is deadly. <laughs> so, of course, Celletti so, shocked him again. Of course, of course. But he can't have meant that. He can't no. have meant, please don't ever do this to me again, because no. he's nuts. No. When he said clearly, don't yes. ever do this to me again. By deadly, what you mean is it really seems to be working. Can I have another crack, Doc? <laughs> you fixed me. This is perfect. I don't need another one. Ah! Why would you do that again to me? Well, ah! What I heard him say was he wanted them more to fix them. So they fixed him. They gave him a larger electric shock, which produced a decent convulsion. And apparently afterwards, the poor Milanese chap didn't remember getting shocked at all. Okay, so enough shocks and you forget all the shocks. There you go. That's, That's an improvement on the chemical seizures where you definitely remember basically everything except for that brief moment or longer moment where you're convulsing like crazy. So that's cool. Um, apparently also, though, Ceretti wasn't really, uh, how was it put? He wasn't insensitive to the effects of what he was doing. He said he saw the reaction of the patient and he thought this ought to be abolished ever since I've looked forward to the time when another treatment would replace electroshock. So anyway, ECT took off. <laughs> so that's cool. Mm. Um, now you can you can make sense of this because in in the 1940s you got to remember psychiatry had a medical model of human distress that really didn't have much success coming up with treatment. So people have gone, holy shit, there's nothing we can do. So mental institutions were full of people basically who were just incarcerated and left there. Yeah, okay. They were chronic and incurable. Um, they were basically probably surrounded by staff who were also pretty pessimistic and demoralized. So they didn't they didn't have anything to do. As in, they had nothing to help. No treatments. So, nothing. Nothing available. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of like, well. We just lock these people up as, in a sense, like they're prisoners because we can't do anything. And I guess else. you get a glimmer of hope somewhere, and you're gonna yeah. you're gonna run with it. Fair enough. Yeah. It's weird how all the gl glimmers of hope seem to be pretty That's cruel. Great. It's the, That's it's great. just weird. That's great. It's just That's weird. Great. So the forties and fifties saw heaps of people get discharged from hospital after they had ECT, and some of them had been in there for years, even decades. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Look. Okay. And it was a hugely important development because the devastating effects of institutionalization, the belief systemically that recovery just wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. You just had to look after these people until they, they somehow died. Um, so it gave people hope. Um, so what about evidence? So did they actually do clinical trials and stuff? Because, you know, evidence, here you go, Shamsi, scientists doing, doing studies. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. It's very, I, yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you feel better now. I, I'm not going to make you feel better. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the, the, the two studies that were first conducted in the 50s to try to compare patients who did or did not receive ECT, they found little to no difference between people who did and didn't. Yeah, but you need a proper placebo. Like you got to. Interesting you should say that. 
so critics of the study said, where's your placebo group? God damn, there you go. I thought oh. Because you're your science guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to imagine, because uh, I remember we t- talked ages ago about pl- placebos in other fields, like placebos in uh, surgery and f- placebos yeah. in physio. Um, I'm just trying to imagine what the placebo is for electroshock therapy. Uh, well, you picked the problem. So at the time, the kind of placebo you would need when some of the side effects were spinal fractures and all kinds of other injuries, biting your tongue off, et cetera, it was pretty difficult to put in. It wouldn't be difficult. You could use a placebo, but it wouldn't be great. No. We're going to shake you an awful lot until you break some stuff. Yeah, we're going to snap a small part of your spine and say, you may or may not have had ECT. How do you feel now? <laughs> yeah, okay. But then in into the 50s, they started to use they, – this is what I love before they didn't. They started to use muscle relaxants, general anesthetics, and stuff. Oh, okay. Before that, they didn't. Sham, I see you started crying. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, to be fair, an aesthetic will like, you know, change your brain physiology. So sure. maybe it will render like, you know, the ECT less less efficient. Yeah. So Ooh, maybe, you don't know. I'm cool. pretty sure that's how they thought. <laughs> you know, trying to like get away with it. Like, no, we're not going to like do no, anything see, about See that. what it is? It's the barbarism <laughs> that is the cure. So you got to go full. you got to go <laughs> exactly. all the way. Oh, Dan, have you read my script? Because I'm telling you. It, oh, anyway, we'll get to that. Um, so they started to be able to do this. So they could give people kind of simulated ECT because they'd knock them out and stuff. So now they had the option to try and do some placebo trials. And they really, in 59, they did the first placebo trials. They included depressed patients, not just schizophrenics. And they found no significant difference between people who got it versus people who didn't. So that didn't work. Bummer. Didn't work. Okay. Didn't appear to. So, and they're also like side effects. So, you know, like potential permanent brain damage. Oh God. But here's some, here's some innovative thinkers. What if the damage isn't a side effect, but the goal? So <laughs> Walter Freeman. <laughs> yeah, I know the C-Sharm scientists are great. <laughs> Cause I, it's because I can, I can, I can imagine the reasoning behind that. I know yeah. you've got a whiteboard and then you start mapping it out. Yeah. And, and like, so, so what, like, what if, wait, wait, wait no. with me here. It's like, look, you know, their brain is not functioning properly at the moment. Yes. So let's like grill their brain yep. and then maybe the damage that you would consider a damage, but at the, at the beginning, their brain wasn't great. So maybe the damage will be better. And, exactly. and you know what, Sham? You know, we're going <laughs> to reframe the word damage. I mean, everyone like, says damage is bad. Modification. You know, it's improvement. Yeah, it's like improvement. Damage. It's like damage. renovation. Yeah. Renovation. Exactly. It's a renovation. <laughs> so Walter Freeman, the guy who I was talking about earlier who did lobotomies, he wrote about ECT and he said, look, the greater the damage, the more likely the remission of psychotic symptoms. Maybe it will be shown that a mentally ill patient can think more clearly and more constructively with less brain actually operating. No. So he thought it through. Remember, this is a guy who'd ram an ice pick through the eye socket and actually deliberately stir it around and trash brains. Another American psychologist said, look, um, there have to be organic changes for the cure to take place. I think that it may be true that these people have, for the time being, at any rate, more intelligence than they can handle and that the reduction (laughs) in intelligence is an important factor in the curative process. You got enough in there. You got enough. Yeah, you got too much. Um, and look, those sorts of arguments are still around. There are studies even in, in the 21st century that suggest that maybe the problem is the brains are overconnected, so you need to kind of oh, okay. less connect. Sure. Okay. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop you right there. That's be, kind of no, 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 no. To be fair, mm. a lot, a lot of you, you know disorders mm. are actually uh, an alteration of the of the capacity of the brain to inhibit itself. Yep. That's that's autism, for example. It's that the problem in epilepsy. It's like too much, like not enough inhibition. Um, yep. So, so I see. I I kind of understand the process. I guess I don't know. I'm trying to I'm trying to fend for my own kind, but like no, no, that sounds. But, <laughs> uh, like, the logic's fine. The but, logic's fine. But it's true that, for example, um, uh, before during my PhD, I was working on on. Um, alteration of memory during aging like normal aging what's mm. what's happening in the brain and so one of the things that's happening is that you need to have an asymmetry of of activity in the brain in in the left versus right brain um that you kind of lose with aging so you have so like we a, get too symmetrical as our brains are exactly like. exactly and so basically what you have is why that, don't our bodies get more symmetrical that's my disappointment <laughs> i'm sorry sorry so, carry on 
um, and so basically that's why the brain is like less efficient. It's not that it can't really be activated. It's almost too active. So there's actually like basically a lot of, a lot of the, also what we were talking about, like uh, glial cells earlier, like the, their mm. like critical role in kind of like being, you know, housekeeping and trying to like maintain everything working properly. This is kind of the same thing. It's like, like what is, what is magical about the brain and about the, the body is how it's actually, f- you know, functioning. Like how, how the hell <laughs> is that working <laughs> with like everything that's, that's happening. And so that's why I mean, like, you know, when they say that maybe if you damage, you're going to go back to something better. It's probably because they were thinking Ooh. that there was too much activity, too much, whatever, but Here's a, here's a dumb person's Damn metaphor. Here's a, um, well, in the sense that uh, cancer is unregulated growth in cells. Exactly. It's cells growing out of control um, yeah, and, exactly. and, not, and not being stopped. And so you could imagine in a similar way connections in the brain uh, not being regulated in a, in a way that they should be. Definitely. Like there are basically it's like, you know, uh, too, too much synapses is not good for the brain. Like this kind of thing. Like you need to, you actually like a lot, uh, also like in development, um, like what you need is to kind of like kill a bunch of cells and you need to kill the, like the cells that I you think, don't need, I think just, but you just need to, that. Uh, I will- uh, yeah. for, for listeners out there, this has to be regulated. This has to be yes. done in yeah. a very controlled environment. This is not, not just indiscriminate. Don't, don't solve, your, solve your problem by. You don't discriminate against cells. Like you know, it's like you. you do well, it. I, I feel better about this now. Ish. <laughs> Less worse. <laughs> I, I can see the logic though. Like the logic, you can see. It. You got too much stuff. We got to get rid of some stuff. Biology is <laughs> about optimum, not maximum. I mean, so that's reasonable. <laughs> Um, there was also, you know, side effect memory loss, like Hemingway spoke about in uh, the very beginning. And there are studies that demonstrate all kinds of memory loss potentials. And the, the one that stuck in my head was done in the uh, 2007, I think it was. And they said, look, the degree of impairment or memory problems was related to the number of ECT someone had. And women and older people were disproportionately affected, typically, typically. Um, as far as death goes, according to the Royal College of Psychiatrists, it's very rare. Um, and the American Psych Association, Psychiatric Association, say about one death per ten thousand ECT oh, okay. recipients. Okay, which is not uh, which is not unlike general anesthesia, etc. But that yeah. does ignore the fact that you get many ECT treatments. Not just still, one. still, mm. still, yeah. So basically, ECT must be bad, right? It doesn't sound good. Um. And so there's a strong critic of ECT called, uh, he's a professor called John Reed. He's a clinical psych professor at the University of East London. And he was writing uh, literally last week even about this. He, he's, um, he's, he's a, uh, a researcher in psychosocial causes of psychosis, the role of the psycho, the pharmaceutical industry in psychology. Mm-hmm. He worked for 20 years as a manager of mental health services, working specifically with people with psychosis. Yep. He's the editor of Models of Madness. So he doesn't know anything Social. about the area. So. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's stupidly qualified. <laughs> um, and in 2010, he co-authored a lit review called The Effectiveness of Electroconvulsive Therapy. So it looked at placebo-controlled studies and it concluded ECT had minim- minimal benefits for people with depression and schizophrenia in particular. Mm-hmm. And so the conclusion was, given the strong evidence of persistent and for some permanent brain dysfunction, primarily uh, primarily evidence in the form of retrograde and enterograde amnesia, memory losses, and the evidence of a slight but significant risk of death, the cost-benefit analysis for ECT is so poor that it cannot be scientifically justified. So he's not pro. But? But psychiatrists said, look, yeah. Yeah, we don't we don't agree with your paper. It's, it's it hasn't got much agenda. Um, just, and just to give us a picture here, evidence. how much is it still done? Oh, we're going to get to that. Oh, tell me now. No, I'm saving it to the end. I'm going to I'm going to tell you about Australia briefly before we wind up. So, uh, psychiatrist said, look, it's an evidence poor paper with an anti ECT agenda. Of course, so, because it said it in the yeah. tin. This is an anti ECT yeah. paper. I, I don't like ECT. Was the giveaway? ECT <laughs> is poo poo. I don't like it. It's garbage science. But Reed, in a much longer article, described his early experiences um, seeing ECT done. So in the early 70s, he says he was a naive 21-year-old in love with his first job since graduating uni as a nursing aide on a psychiatric ward in New York. Three times a week, several older women would sit in a line against the wall in the corridor. Some were slumped motionless in their chairs. Others seemed scared and agitated. Occasionally, one would try to run off 
and was brought back to the chair by kind but firm staff. Mm-hmm. But firm. But firm. Exactly. Kind but firm. <laughs> what a job that is for Hart Carnegie. <laughs> When I found out that they were waiting for electroshock, I volunteered for the job of sitting with them as they came round after the general anaesthetic. So they'd had the seizure and stuff. They would ask me things like, where am I? Who am I? Why is my head pounding? And why did they do this to me? I remember being unable to answer the old lady who asked me in tears, why would they do such a thing to me? So he says, and this is his quote, I had a similar reaction to Meduna and Cerletti, chemical guy and electricity guy, when I witnessed my first ECT. Having watched the woman convulse and then become limp, I wheeled her unconscious body back down the corridor, not a very reassuring sight for the other people in the queue, and I ended up in the car park throwing up. God. So he says, even before knowing what the research said about ECT, I'd had quite literally a gut reaction that something was dreadfully wrong. So he's a longtime anti-ECT guy. A lot of qualifications, but very, very anti. So that must mean it's all crap. Hmm. It's complicated. ACT is complicated. You'd be amazed to hear. So there was a piece literally last month in The Guardian, August of last month, UK Guardian. Oh, sorry, for those of you listening in the future, last month was uh, August 2021. (laughs) There are people in 3,000 years listening to this going, my God, they weren't all idiots. (laughs) <laughs> so the author will <laughs> shaking his head disbelieving okay some of us are idiots. yeah 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 Ish. <laughs> so the author rebecca lawrence is a consultant psychiatrist so she says because her story is interesting um views about ect are polarized there's good evidence that it works and is safe although medication is usually needed to maintain long-term remission from your symptoms there are people who've been treated with ect who consider they have been permanently damaged So that's not untrue. As a doctor and a psychiatrist, I know all treatments will have potential unwanted effects, but it would be wrong to say that such problems are not always possible. We mustn't forget that the illness that requires ECT or illnesses are horrible and they might cause damage if they're left untreated. Yeah. And and Sham, you kind of alluded to this, like if if what you're dealing with is so horrible anyway and has such long-term and damaging effects, maybe it's the cruel to be kind. Our author goes on, I know that ECT is a rapid and life-saving treatment in severe depression and when the patient is suicidal or no longer able to care for themselves. So the worse the illness, the better it seems to work, she's quoted as saying. Okay, okay. Which is comforting. Uh, We've all seen patients who are barely communicating, transformed by even one or two treatments, eating and talking, for example, and freed from their burden of suffering. She continues... It was like that for me. Okay. I have had courses over the years to treat psychotic depression. She's had more than 70 ECT treatments herself. Um, Initially when she was pregnant with the first child and most recently three years ago, which is literally from today. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, Without it, I'm not sure I would have recovered to be with family or train as a psychiatrist. If I, if I have to do it again, if I need to, I will. So she's, you know, pretty clear. During my last course, I went from feeling entirely hopeless about the future to my mood lifting with each session. So that's good. Will's looking at me suspiciously. I'm, I, I just, I just, oh God, I want to know how it works. If it does, I mean, I know you just said, uh, yeah, some people say that uh, the people against it say there's no evidence that it does. What even is the theory? What's going? I mean, is it just destroying some connections? Is it random across the brain? What's happening? Yeah. <laughs> what am I, science guy? I don't I'll, know. I'll get to some a bit more rounding up stuff. But um, our God, I'm terrible. I've forgotten her name. Rebecca Lawrence uh, went on. She said, um, "Where was I? Yes, during my last course, I went from hopeless, blah blah blah. Um, it reduced the severity of my depression within weeks, and life was worth living again." Now, this this is where it gets interesting. Personally, I don't believe I'm cognitively impaired, although it's hard to prove that. Uh, she sounds uh, but, like she's got a, uh, a yeah. serious job. So that would be one indicator. Well, that's what she yeah. says. I've maintained a challenging career, taken postgraduate degrees. Yeah. I have children, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But I felt the downsides of ECT as well. For example, my memory was significantly affected each time. And she's talked to a lot of patients who've, who've had ECT and had similar things. She says, though, some welcome this because it's um, they forget times of great distress and suffering. So the memory loss is sort of like an added bonus. You don't even pay extra for that. Yeah. 
But she goes on, for me, it's as though there are big holes in my memory before and during a course of treatment. My daughter was a baby when I first had it, and I've lost a, uh, her first, much of the first two years of her life. Oh, that's not good. No, I don't like that. No, I thought, you know, you know, there's plenty of good times that we don't remember. You know, there's plenty of nights out. Most of my good times yeah, exactly, are pretty blurry. Exactly, but, <laughs> but I don't want to lose, like, the first two years of my child's life. That's not good. How do you know you haven't, man? Uh, maybe I have. Look, I'm, I'm, in fairness <laughs> to me, I've lost everything that's not, you know, right now. Uh, <laughs> you don't even know what yesterday or tomorrow either, no, I've got no idea. Yeah. But at the same, at the same time, it's always a, a question of, like, cost benefits kind of thing. Because yeah. at the same time... You know, if she hadn't been treated, maybe she had, she wouldn't have had this child altogether yeah. because yeah. You know, it was like suicidal thoughts and stuff like that. So, or potentially a whole career by the sounds of it. Yeah. Yeah. She, she goes on to say, I also have no memory ever of having consented to treatment. But, <laughs> but, but, she but I love she it did. anyway. <laughs> well, she assumes she did. Yeah, because it's probably right before. So yeah, that's the first thing well, that you well see, I'm the kind of person that that you know I, I check if I should consent to things. So if it if it happened, then obviously I gave consent. Sounds like something I would have looked into first. <laughs> uh, <I'm> a psychiatrist <laughs> and shit. Uh, <laughs> but she does say, look, you know, the people who are against it can be really outrageously angry and say clinicians are trying to cause deliberate harm. The people who are pro can be really insanely positive. So she, she summarizes and says that there are no real, they're not any clear goods or bads or rights or wrongs. It should be a clinical, not a moral decision. And there are a lot of moral issues with ECT. Um, apparently antidepressants are a lot more accepted now. But if you said to someone, you know, you're going to work and say, sorry, I've been away. I had a, a series of electroconvulsive shock treatments. People are going to go, are you, are you going to stab me? Or have you come back from the dead? Like it's highly stigmatized. Yeah. But she says as a clinician, she's, she thinks it's a very good treatment, but she wouldn't be complacent about it. Mm. Um, and she says, until we have another better treatment that works rapidly, I think there will be a place for it, you know, basically in the arsenal. I think, I think when you think about it, you know, like um, any other medication, there well, plenty of other medications, particularly for uh, really difficult to treat uh, things, whether they're, they're um, psychological, mental, or other part of the body, uh, yep. involve a lot of side effects and problems that they cause. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that when we do things that are chemical, we kind of accept, okay, chemical does this on your body, yeah. and you know, chemo, whatever, um, you're yep. going to... You're going to get a lot of uh, negative symptoms. Um, yep. This, they're quite visceral. You know, the the first versions of ECT, it's, it's a visceral sort yeah. of thing that we think medicine shouldn't do that. We shouldn't be doing that to people. Yeah, it doesn't look pretty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but at the same time, it. you can also, like, like, as you were saying, like those drugs, they don't have, they have plenty of side effects and mm -hmm. you have to take them every day. And if you stop taking them, then it takes weeks to like kick in again and, and so, you know, if like with ECT, you can have, you know, one massive treatment, but then you're fine for years. Yep. That's also like a, an everyday life benefit. Look, psychiatry, like psychiatrists won't like me for saying this. And if there are any of you listening, I semi-apologize. Psychiatry is a very suck it and see profession. And it's not because they're bastards, it's because they don't have a lot of choice. Um, mm. It's not always clear what will happen. You only know there'll be some kind of an effect and it could be better for one person than another. So in answer to some of your early questions, we're just going to round up. Let's go local. Local and today, ECT in Australia. Do we do it? Yes, we do. That's for sure. And I'm just just, just quickly, oh, a couple we, of sources. Are we good at it? Do we do it more than other people or less than We're other the people? best at we it. Like, excellence we, in all ECTs. I, I, I care a lot about where we sit in the rankings table. 73% <laughs> of Australians have had or will have ECT no. in their lifetime. You can take that to the bank not a bank that will give you money. So the Australian National Office of the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, the CCHR, they're a mental health watchdog. They say, while most people are under the impression that electroshock therapy is banned in Australia because the mere idea of electroshock is so abhorrent, its use has significantly increased and is being used on the most vulnerable in society, children and the elderly. Electroshock is the application of hundreds of volts of electricity to the brain. It can cause severe and permanent memory loss, brain damage, suicide, cardiovascular complications, intellectual impairment, and even death. Okay, let's be clear. The Australian National Office of the Citizens Commission on Human Rights is a front for Scientology. <laughs> Why did you bring it in? Why did because you do it that? looks really legitimate. And I, when I first heard about this, when I was doing some psychology stuff in the late 90s, people started showing me pamphlets from these people. Very convincing like super duper convincing. They're very good at it. 
Scientology is by definition against psychiatry and psychology. Yeah. And in fact, L. Ron Hubbard's book, Battlefield Earth, the baddies are called cyclos because he's against such people. Like there's no there's no subtlety there. So Did they use any you, electroshock therapy, the baddies? Oh God, they didn't you see John Travolta acting like he's in a high school play? Like one of the worst movies I, ever I, invented I didn't by watch a human. It. I'm not as I'm not as much of a sucker for bad sci-fi. I didn't finish it. It was that bad that even I didn't finish it. <laughs> I've, I've walked out of two movies in my life and that was one of them. I don't remember the other one because I was um, trying to cure my PTSD. <laughs> so real, real people. I'm just warning people because it looks, it looks legit. If you look up the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, you will see a very official looking website with a lot of apparent Crazy. information. Um, also, it's not hundreds of volts. It's not done to children. It might be done to the elderly, et cetera, et cetera. So real people. So the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. Do we do it in Australia? Yes. They say about 7,500 people a year get it. 300 in New Zealand. So New Zealand is healthier than us. We already knew that. <laughs> um, they say in their, in their pamphlet, why use it? Point one, it works. It can improve or clear depression in nearly 70% of patients. It's been proven to help with other conditions like mania and schizophrenia. Um, it also works quickly. It can be life-saving for some people because they might, for example, not be eating or drinking literally because their depression is so bad. Um, they also say it's safe and has few side effects. That's a good option if nothing else is working. Now, here's how they describe ECT. It's, it uses a small electric current to briefly stimulate the brain. It's performed under anesthetic in a hospital. Evidence shows ECT. Stimulate's a nice word, isn't it? I, mean, isn't I, it nice? I like being stimulated. Yeah. It doesn't sound small, horrific at all. And a small current to stimulate you. Yeah. That's great framing there. So, We've all yeah. been there. We've all used a small current. to. It's, right. it's, um, you do it under anesthetic. Evidence shows it clears symptoms of depression and, and other mental illnesses. It's safe, painless, and effective in treating depression. So that's from the Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. SANE Australia uh, endorse it. They're um, a, a, a mental health charity. They support research and advocacy in um, psychiatric and, and mental illness issues. The Queensland government in 2018 have a really handy book called The Administration of Electroconvulsive Therapy. It's 49 pages. I read the bugger. It's fascinating. It's very thorough, and it covers everything. It's sensational. <laughs> Um, so your your former countrymen, the Queensland folk, only a couple of years ago were very clear about how to do it. None of them say it's the best thing. None of them say it's the worst thing. They're very clear and calm and talk it through. And it also includes um, advice for practitioners, et cetera. So if you're interested, people, the administration of electroconvulsive therapy. Don't do it at home. No. Queen, no, no, no. If, you, if you're interested, then go and do like an undergraduate, then a postgraduate, then uh, a whole bunch that more qualifications. does not no. say anywhere, don't do this at home. Well, it should. You're, you're not the expert. It should, it should. do it at home. It, uh, it, look, home-based care is great. Especially during COVID. So I'm going to give the final word to the Black Dog Institute, who are a, a support group, et cetera, and have been for a long time for people particularly with depression. They say, look, sometimes occasional memories from the past may be forgotten. Obviously, it can't be memories from the future, but I won't critique them on that. Oops, I did. Um, the big quote here is, it's also important to note that many patients suffering from depression already have problems with attention, concentration, thinking, and memory prior to commencing ECT. So what's the some worry, people, eh? Well, no, just some <laughs> people are wildly impaired already by the condition that they're getting it for. Like they are very, very unwell. It's, it's, it can be a, a progressive and debilitating condition. And they're saying, look, there's a lot of preparation before it would be approved for a person. Seven and a half thousand is not a lot out of, what are we now? 800 million? In Australia, something like that, 900 million. I don't know. So other than very, very angry aunties, it seems to be we're still at, we've got to be cruel to be kind, but we're a lot cleverer about it than we used to be. And I agree, like what Sean was saying, it's a cost-benefit analysis, you know? Like you've got to kind of go, well, how bad is what I already have? How are other treatments working? Damn, Mate, all right. This is okay. Yeah. It, it shows how, how – well, what I want to know from Sham is is – how much do we understand about any sorts of treatments for uh, for what's going on in the brain? I mean, I want you to list every treatment and talk about no, that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it does it does show you know as you said before, it's a suck it and see, and and it still seems so difficult to understand what the uh, the brain setup is that contributes to a condition and then contributes to um, some sort of intervention towards a cure. No, Are you it's fixing just... that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, that, but that's that's true. That like, um, first of all, the brain is still like 
a lot of like just a black box like it's i it kind of feels like the more you know the less you know like it's it's kind of like this feeling being a neuroscientist like it's, it's a bit of frustrating but also like um you know it's like that's why because like most of what you've been thinking uh, talking about is more about psychiatry and what you know what you were saying that like psychiatrists at the end of the day they don't have a lot of tools also to treat those people yep. and like this and also I'm, I'm i'm trying to kind of like wrap up everything that you said and like yes also the problem is that we don't have a factory of schizophrenic patients coming to us that we can test and so that you know it's like most of us neuroscientists not most of us but a lot of us are like working on animals for these reasons but like then like you know the um there's such a gap between you know what you can discover on animals and then whether or not it's going to translate to humans so so like there's such a long way like it's it's the reason why it's fascinating and why you know it makes us want to keep on studying it and understanding more and that's also why it's so frustrating because at the end of the day the reason why you are a neuroscientist most often than not is because you want to help people and you know and advance yeah. you know like knowledge but also like just help people that have this like untreatable diseases so it's like it's an everyday struggle to be doing something that is like really relevant without actually grilling their brain <laughs> so <laughs> now there's there's time for that in terms of grilling brains yeah. <laughs> it's a bit late it's a bit but late I, I wonder if this we're moving into the world this to me sounds like another example, though it might sound weird, of personalized or precision medicine. You know, it may be instead of this whole kind of, well, you seem kind of like the 800 people we saw last year, we'll give you this too. You can get a lot more direct about the specific problems facing a human biochemically, biophysiologically. And then maybe it will be extremely precise. Yeah. Medication, electricity, whatever, drugs. Yeah. Maybe and that's the thing is that, go to. yeah, for example, like in, in, in well, like following this example of these patients it's like um it would be great to know like to study the people where it did work and the people where it didn't work so mm -hmm. that then you can kind of pinpoint why it worked and then you can go towards like more personalized medicine being like oh no there's no there's no point in trying that because it's like too hard and it's not going to work on you for that that and that reason and that would be great like it's definitely something that we should go towards as opposed to just, you don't seem well, let's shock you. Yeah. Well, if I understood properly, like in any case, it's like when it's a last resort kind of kind of method anyway. So It, it seems to be that way. Like it, it's not mm. like they're not, they don't quite say we're desperate, but they say, look, what we have so far, and I think it's a good call from the psychiatrist who'd also experienced it. She said, we don't want it to be a moral decision either way. It shouldn't be a moral decision because mm. it looks bad or seems extreme. It, it may be entirely appropriate. Um, for someone who's really suffering and they, and we don't know what else to do and there's some evidence, more than none, that it could help. How much, um, I, don't, I don't know if this is a, uh, you, you work with uh, mouse models um, in, in yeah. your work. Um, how much can, can we uh, use mice or other animals as an analogy for the brain in the sense that, you know, we use, you use mice for other sorts of features or we use ferrets for our respiratory system and stuff like that. Uh, we but, use ferrets? Yeah, I told you that a while ago. We use ferrets for our <laughs> respiratory system. Did you uh, tell me in a podcast? Because I don't listen to podcasts. I did. Like I, did. I, I literally <laughs> did. Um, but, you know, uh, they're all pretty similar. You know, the idea of breathing, mm. you know, our lungs, uh, at least mm. similar-ish to ferrets. But, uh, but I like to think that our brains are special. Uh, can, can we... Can well, we, they are. Well, they yeah. are. but can Thank we really you. use, can we use mice models and things like that to, to work on when it's looking at, um, you know, neurons and, and psychiatric issues? Yeah, so, so yes and no. Yes, because, because in a way, for whatever reason, the mouse is not that far away from, from humans. It's like, it's still mammal. It's still like, it, it does replicate a lot of feature, but for example, um, like the brain, like the human brain is of course, incredibly more complex than a mouse brain. It's like for many different reasons, like a lot of like functions that uh, humans have mice don't and so for example I'm, I'm studying the the prefrontal cortex like something that i think most people would have heard of heard of um and for example the the, the prefrontal cortex of mice definitely do not replicate the one that we have 
that's for sure. But then you know that, for example, some other function that would be you, that would be developed by the prefrontal cortex in in humans is actually more like done in other parts of the brain in mice, and it's just a matter of like. Oh. From the moment we can't just have this factory of schizophrenic patients and you know like Alzheimer's and all one day we'll get it right though exactly we'll have that. exactly yeah. you know like let it give us ten years <laughs> um, we have to use models so so we do know like the limitations of the models that we use and like then for example mice are widely used just because um, like. They're very small. They reproduce pretty quickly, so that's con- like convenient in so the worst part of the thing. But all also, you need is a small, uh, small factory of uh, a factory of small schizophrenic patients. So, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's exactly. The size like, like, can- like uh, yeah, like avatars or something like that. That would be great. That would be great. Um, but yeah, and also mice are like genetically, you can you can manipulate their genomes pretty easily. So we were able to do a lot of um, genetic modification to have genetic tools. So for example, if you want to study um, one particular, like the function of one particular gene, it's very easy. Well, very easy. It can take years, but it's easier (laughs) than in other species to uh, flag it and to be able to, for example, delete it or modify it so that you can understand its function, uh, which is a lot more difficult to do in other species. So uh, for example, they started to do that in rats, but it's it's not as easy as in mice. So that's why a lot of people are using mice. Uh, but for example, I have a I have an example that really, like, as a scientist, you you're always kind of afraid that whatever you're researching is not going to be um, relevant, or you know, like whether it's going to be reproducible or this kind of thing. And one thing that really I, I really liked about my research is that when I was doing my PhD, I was working on um, the alteration of memory in aging and I was working on the mouse model and my former boss developed this entire like very complex um, memory task in mice to study a memory that is normally typically human. So it's your memory of events and all of that. So everything that happened in your life. So mm-hmm. it's difficult to assess in mice. So she developed this entire task um, and studying the mice, we knew like what type of, of um, uh, what structure in the brain were activating when you were doing that. And then later in her career, she, she developed this exact same task on a video game and, and started to test humans. And she put those humans in an fMRI and it was exactly uh, the same uh, brain uh, activations uh, <laughs> in mice and in humans. So were mice better or humans? Who won, who won the video games? <laughs> Humans. <laughs> I'm a bit sad because <laughs> I'm rooting for the mice. They've been really good. <laughs> it's a new, mo- motto, so, new motto for humanity. Humans better than yeah, mice exactly. at one video game. One video so, game, not all video games. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so that's really the kind of situations where you know that then you have an amazing model to kind of like keep on studying humans and try to do everything that you can do in humans, you know, like then you can, you can study, um, you can use this video game to kind of like understand how memory alterations are in schizophrenia or Down syndromes or in Alzheimer's, this kind of thing. And then you can keep on using your mouse model to kind of like understand the, the mechanisms and like dysregulate it in those diseases and try to find maybe some drugs that then you can try in humans using that same task and see whether you're improving, you know, this kind of thing. So that was basically kind of like the, the pipeline that we had and that I'm still trying to do now, now with autism, but that's, that's kind of what we're doing. So do, can we have a commitment from you that you'll come back on and we will talk to you more specifically about your work in maybe a few weeks? Yes. Mice video games. Oh, my, <laughs> mice video games yeah. and autism. Yes, I, I want to talk about how I could I could the test teaser you is guys. How, do you, how do you get <laughs> autistic mice? You mentioned that. Don't tell me now, but the idea of an autistic mouse, how you do it, and how you even know uh, that for me is enough. So okay. we will get you back, Sham. Thank you. We will. So get you're you doing back. a massive teaser for <laughs> the next. That's that's good. It's teasing me too because I really <laughs> want to know, but you can't tell me yet. Otherwise, I, I won't be as excited when we talk next. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much, yeah. Sham. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you much. So, you know, um, I'm. Uh, you've made me happier, Rod. You've made me happier that... ECT, what? I failed. ECT I never tried to do is, that. You know, I, you know I, I feel more comfortable with ECT than I was before. So you're going to get it now after all? Sure, sure. I'll do some at home. 
if you want, look, I've I've researched a lot. I reckon I could give it a crack. I've read that whole Queensland manual, so, and I've got a battery. Oh yeah, I've got I've got no 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 whole hand crank <laughs> hand crank like a oh, you know, wait actually barbarians. actually I'm sorry I'm like because we did have something for you guys. What? So just one oh my second. God. Is it the machine? Do you know if we'd done this live, they were gonna. We did find a machine. A machine. Put the 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 we on did you. find an ECT machine. Oh, oh my did god! Find Lying around. Yes. Do you do that on mice? Put a mouse on that. No. I no, was going to pull it on you, Will. If this show had been live and in person, I was going to pull this out so on you. I'm sorry because it's mirrored. But there's in the middle, there's something wrong. <laughs> it's written violation, and I really don't oh, want no, 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 to know why, yeah. why there is a that's, little that's for the thing of violation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> shock shock, shock is in the mouth, and violation is in the rectum. Uh. <laughs> uh, it's not for mice. I'm pretty sure it's way too big for mice. <laughs> so very small. I'm very much afraid of what people have done in this institute in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look up your history. Don't look up your history. I won't. I won't. Thank you so much, Sham. Um, the Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant, him, Rod Lamberts, joined today by Sham Alabed and supported today both by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science and Brain Teaser. Yeah. Yes, Brain Teaser. Come and check the website <laughs> thank you much live audience thank you guys thank you gang